justice and the American way. The American way. We are. We are the voices, the voices of, of dissent. dissent. Welcome. We are live from Fort Wayne, Indiana. This is the Voices of the Sense, and this is Justin McKenzie, joined by Mark Jernigan, Rick Runstead, and John Olinger. Thanks for joining us today. We also have Richard Boykin on the line. He is from Chicago. He is the newly elected uh, county commissioner of Cook County, the second largest county in the country, and they are uh, over, he's overseeing a $3 billion annual budget, and he'll be sworn in on Monday. Thanks for joining us, Mr. Boykin. Well, let me thank you all for having me. I'm honored to be on your show. Uh, Mr. Boykin, uh, Rick Ronstead here. Uh, would like to first get your input as far as the, the verdict in Ferguson. Uh, first off, do you think that the verdict was correct to not press criminal charges against the police officer, number one? And number two is, do you believe that the outrage exhibited by the community there in Ferguson is appropriate? Well, first let me say that, um, you know, Obviously, it was a tragedy to have the young man shot so many times and killed. Uh, I have not had a chance to read through all of the evidence that was presented to the grand jury. However, being an attorney myself, I do know that a prosecutor has the ability to indict a ham sandwich. I learned that in law school, that if a prosecutor wants to get an indictment, they can get one. Uh, so, I mean, you know, one has to wonder whether or not the way that the evidence was presented, you know, would have actually led to a indictment. I know that uh, a lot of people are disappointed. Uh, it, it begins to open up old wounds of, you know, uh, police interaction in minority communities. Uh, I think that one of the tragedies is, and, and maybe a bright uh, light here, is that, you know, Ferguson is a town that's 90-plus percent African-American. And it is a town where you have pretty much, I mean, the establishment that's in charge is not African-American. And so maybe folks will get up and go out and vote. And, and vote their interests. Uh, and then, you know, mayors select police chiefs. And, you know, you can vote your interests. I know that, uh, you know, recently, I mean, the uh, town didn't even have, I think they had one African American on the police force. I think they've upped that number since. Uh, so, I mean, it opens up old wounds. We have an opportunity here, I think, to uh, really talk about the, 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 the question of, you know, justice and police, uh, community interaction, and figure out a way going forward that we don't have these types of incidences. I mean, these types of incidences, I think, bring out the worst in Americans. You asked the question about the response. I thought that the response uh, was the worst kind of response that we could have in terms of of an American citizen. I mean, looting and rioting is not the proper response, even if you don't get the desired indictment that you want. Now, I took to Twitter, and I basically said that the, you know, that, that, that basically, look, the uh, justice, the arm of justice is long, and the arc of justice bends, bends towards righteousness. And the reality of it is, is that ultimately, you know, if, if this officer was in the wrong, you know, God, he will have to face God one day. And, and, and God will, you know, begin to take care of that. So, I mean, I, I think it was tragic, the response of the people, uh, many of them who, you know, turned over police cars and set police cars afire. These same police cars that are going to police their communities uh, burned up. Uh, businesses and looted businesses in their community. It's not the right response. Uh, we can do better, and we certainly must do better as Americans. I, I completely agree with that. Uh, one thing is very early on, the Attorney General Eric Holder, when he went down to uh, Missouri, he said 
not only am I the Attorney General, I am also a black man. Do you feel it was appropriate for him to interject his race as being a criteria for a prism from which he saw this incident, or would it have been more appropriate if he had remained race neutral and simply viewed his job as making sure that justice was done irrespective of race? Yeah, look, I, 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 I think ultimately uh, people understand that he's an African-American. You know, that he's black. I mean, they, they can look at him and tell. Uh, and he should just view the job from being attorney general, or, you know, where the ultimate aim is making sure that justice is served. Um, and so, I, you know, maybe we had a missed opportunity there where he could have done it a little bit better. Um, I, you know, I, look, I hope that, um, we can continue the conversation and dialogue. I think that some of the rioting is a cry out for leadership, one in the black community. I think it's a cry out for help. I mean, a lot of people, you know, they, they, they saw this as an opportunity to get their moment in the, the sunshine or, you know, their, their 15 seconds of fame. I mean, uh, but it, it was the wrong reaction. And I'm just not so sure either that the folks in Missouri, uh, you know, handled the situation the best that they could have either. I mean, they brought up uh, the National Guard in advance of the, uh, the, the announcement of the indictment. So, I mean, there was a stirring, a powder keg kind of feeling and emotion that there wasn't going to be an indictment. Um, and so ultimately what, what I've heard people say is that the life of somebody who's black just doesn't mean as much as the life of somebody who's white. I mean, why is it that police get to just willy-nilly kill black, you know, kids or shoot black men? And there are no consequences. So, and, and, and let me say the counter to that. I want to speak out against the... Uh, Violence that's raging in our own community. Look, in the black community, in Chicago, I mean, when it's warm out, you can, you can count on having 20 or 30 shootings a weekend. You can count on maybe six or seven, ten people being killed. And many of those shootings, 90% of them, occur in the black community, and it's black-on-black -black crime. And so we have to deal with that, too. Uh, from the standpoint of a community standpoint and figuring out, hey, wait a minute now. We, we, we got to treasure and value our lives. This is the next generation. I mean, th these are the folks who are going to, you know, make America go and make America the greatest. And so what I say is that, look, we're all Americans. We all have an, op we all have a responsibility to make America the greatest nation on the planet. And, we got to figure out how we get together and how we get along. Black and white, we're all precious in God's sight. I mean, we're told that. And so, I mean, we just got to figure out how we get along. We're speaking with Richard Boykin, who served uh, Danny Davis as his chief of staff. Danny Davis was a United States congressman, and now he's the newly elected uh, Cook County Commissioner. M Mr. Boykin, why do you think there was so much protest to the Ferguson incident itself at, you know, when so many other uh, police shootings are occurring across the country, like the Powell shooting, um, where the, uh, the black couple also got shot over in Cleveland, Ohio. 197 rounds were fired at them in their car. Why do you think they latched on to Ferguson and not, and not these other cases? That's a, the most confusing part of it to me is that Ferguson is, is a very confusing case, whereas the Powell shooting in St. Louis was obvious police brutality. Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, a lot of this, too, is uh, determinative of the media coverage and the visibility in the media. I mean, uh, Ferguson was, the spotlight was put on Ferguson 24-7. I mean, the media went down there, they camped out, they stayed down there. I mean, the dynamic, you know, there is a little different. I mean, you got a black town pretty much that's being headed up by, you know, white people. And uh, I think that, that, that folks looked at it a little bit differently. And, they, you know, obviously I think whenever you have a, a police uh, shooting, I mean, there ought to be uh, an independent investigative body that looks into it, makes sure that uh, 
you know, the, the, the person's civil rights and, and human rights are not violated. Yeah, yeah. But that, you know, you know I mean, we had, things went the right way. A few weeks ago, sir, we had Gerald Salente on, and Gerald Salente's perspective is it doesn't matter what color or creed you are. If you are um, detained, pulled over, questioned by any member of law enforcement, you must immediately capitulate and act like they're your king, and there are no repercussions to any actions that law enforcement ever take against any of its citizens. He even talks about in New York, back in the 80s and the 90s, New York had a similar situation where they had just rampant police corruption and police brutality. So they instituted a separate investigative body, and it wasn't too long before the New York Police Department had essentially compromised the entire body, and the investigative body became just another mouthpiece of the police force. How do we police the police is the question that we've had. We had the sheriff of Allen County on our show after Ferguson, and his response to Ferguson was the entire police department handled it incorrectly. And that's the reason the media frenzy started is because the entire department handled it, handled the situation completely wrong. Right. So, you know, when I was working for the congressman, we actually um, headed up this um, this committee for the Congressional Black Caucus on police misconduct. And we did so after what happened to a gentleman named Amadou Diallo, who was shot in New York City. I think they shot, uh, I think they are shot maybe 40 sometimes. It was an, uh, a crazy number of, of uh, rounds that were let off. And so, you know, we began to look at this whole question. Now, prior to that, when I was in law school, I actually wrote a pamphlet on understanding your rights under the Fourth Amendment, against unreasonable search and seizure. And it was basically a community pamphlet that we handed out at churches and we educated folks on, hey, if you're stopped by the police, what do you do? Yeah, well, right. one, you don't reach underneath your seat. You put your hands on the steering wheel. You roll your window down. You say, yes, officer, how can I help you? What can I do? You know, I mean, you be kind, you be polite, you be gentle. And I, I think... Um, all of this is about education to a certain extent. And, of course, you got to have cultural sensitivity. I mean, where you have, um, you know, uh, white police and black communities, they need to understand something about black folk. I mean, and you got to have more community policing. Uh, you got to have folks walk in the street, people who understand the community. And so I think we got a long way to go uh, in terms of law enforcement and community relations but the good news is we're all living and we still got the opportunity to get there yeah, so there and, and and with regard to independent boards you just got to make sure that those boards are independent and they're not compromised by the police or compromised by prosecutors or anybody else but that they're independent and 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 their their charge is beholden to getting to the bottom of the facts basically getting to the bottom line one of the uh, the corrections correctional acts that we could do to possibly prevent some of this police brutality is to make police officers wear body cameras. How do you feel about that as a solution? Well, I mean, it's something that uh, I'm aware of, uh, the proposal. Uh, look, I, I think that um, as long as it doesn't uh, uh, put the police in a difficult position, I mean, um, you know, I mean, I'd, I'd be for everything that we can to ameliorate uh, some of the uh, uh, misconduct that has occurred or perceived misconduct. Obviously, uh, you know, our rights uh, have been so limited now uh, by Homeland Security since 9-11. I mean, there are cameras everywhere. There are cameras everywhere. You can walk down the street. There's probably a camera above. We, you know, have these... Uh, uh, objects flying above that, that that are taking pictures, and so I mean, there it, it could be a solution, you know. So I, I I would say we ought to look at it, and we ought to maybe do a pilot program and see how it works. In uh, New Mexico, there was an incident where a uh, a white gentleman was gunned down by police officers. The chief of police showed a still frame from one of those body cameras and said, "Look, he's uh, pointing a gun." Uh, or what looked like a gun at the police officers. So the defense attorney insisted and petitioned and finally received the actual body camera, which you can now view on the Internet, 
and you see that the police officers simply gun the guy down. He's totally unarmed, and uh, and then they proceed to uh, ill-treat him as he's laying there in a pool of his own blood. Um, <clears throat> would there be any reason why you could see why this would create an undue burden on police officers having body cameras, which for the public would give them the ability, like in New Mexico, where we could review the facts and see whether or not the police officer's narrative, in fact, is true or not. Look, I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a police officer, so I can't tell you what they go through on a day-to-day -day basis, what their shift is like and that sort of thing. But I would like to get their take on it. I would like to get, uh, you know, we got a good sheriff in Cook County, Sheriff Tom Dart, who uh, has done some tremendous things. I'd like to get his take on it. So I, I think before we act uh, willy-nilly and knee-jerk reaction to some of these things that have take place, taken place, we have to figure out, you know, uh, what's in the best interest of the community, what's in the best interest of America. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, and so you got to have every side at the table, and you got to make some good arguments on both sides, I'm sure. But at the end of the day, I mean, we got to do what's in the best interest of the community. Mr. Boykin, John Olinger here. Um, what do you do to redirect the anger from this incident, from riding into the streets into something productive, either politically or socially? Well, look, I, I think that, um, I, I think, one, you got to deal with the whole unemployment issue. I think there is uh, a sense uh, in America, when you look at unemployment, and black unemployment is twice that of white unemployment, and sometimes three and four times that of white unemployment. So there is a real sense of uh, America having turned her back on black America. Uh, now, and then when you look Mr. at Boykin, the achievement. Mark, yes, this well, is Mark Jernigan. I, I, I hate to say this, but when you say that, it sends me to the moon. It makes me very angry because this country was... I know. I know, country. but let me, let me clean it up no, no, for no, you. No, no, so no, no. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm going somewhere with it because I completely agree with you. This country was founded on the premise that every individual counts. Every individual matters. And, and, and when we turn our back on that principle... Man, it sends me to the moon. I'm, I'm not saying you have, sir. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying that I get extraordinarily angry when I hear people talk about how America has lost its vision that everyone counts. It, it, it hurts me to no end. Well, let me say this. As, as sad as it is, America was founded on slave labor. America was founded with the concept that all men, white men, are created equal. Uh, not black men, not women, you know. And we've grown a long time since then. I mean, we're 150 years out since the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. And so, but but still, when you have uh, things like the achievement gap, when you have things like poor schools and uh, black communities and black kids dropping out faster than anybody else in the country, um, and when you have a a prison population that's swollen at the seams and basically made up of black males. Mm -hmm. well, let me give you the count in Cook County. Mm -hmm. Cook County on any given day at the jail, you can have 10,000 people there. Yep. Seventy percent of them look like me. They're black. They're black, young black men. Now, the county of Cook, 5.4 million people, is not a majority black county. I mean, so... What I'm saying to you is this, is that there is a sense among some folk, some of these folk. Now, I, I think there are some people who genuinely wanted to protest a non-indictment. But then there are some folks who really like to take advantage of situations like this, and they like to exacerbate situations like this. But we got to deal with the issue of can America make sure that everybody has an opportunity to live the American dream of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, let me say this to you. There were a lot of big banks, my friend, who targeted for subprime mortgages uh, blacks and Hispanics, and they lost their homes. They lost their homes. We're, we're speaking so, with uh, Richard Boykin, newly elected Count Cook County Commissioner. We'll be right back here to continue our conversation with him on the Voices of Dissent. 
Welcome back to the Voices of Descent. This is Justin McKenzie, joined by Mark Jernigan, Rick Runstead, and John Olinger. And on the line, we have newly elected Cook County Commissioner Richard Boykin. Uh, he is serving the west side of Chicago. Uh, thank you for joining us, sir. Hey, thank you for having me. And I want to give a shout-out to my good friend Joe Walburn and to all of you all there, because I think you guys do tremendous work and you're a tremendous vehicle uh, for dissent and uh, for just common sense dialogue. Thank you very much for those kind words, sir. We we try our best, and sometimes we uh, we get a little we get a little excited, but we uh, we definitely uh, try to have common sense. In today's world, common sense is almost a superpower. <laughs> Absolutely, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, Rick Ronstadt again here. Um, you had mentioned as far as crime and crime statistics and, and things along that line, uh, and, and you'd mentioned that in Cook County, 70% uh, of those people that you'll see being processed through the system are African American. Would you recommend that sentencing be reduced for crimes in general or that uh, race be considered uh, towards crime so that there's less black sentencing. What would be your solution to it? I mean, how would you say, okay, there's there's a disproportionately large number of African Americans in prison, a massively underrepresentative low number of Asians uh, that are incarcerated. How would you how would you rectify that problem? Well, I, I think you got to do a couple of things. One, a job is a good way to rectify that problem. I think if people have meaningful employment. Uh, and I think if they have an education, I think they're less likely to commit crimes in the beginning. I would also say this, that, uh, you know, having parents at home who help to raise their children up in the right way would also be a, a, a good solution. And having folks who are involved in faith-based uh, uh, churches uh, is a way as well. Now, I will tell you just based on my experience of growing up in Inglewood, one of the most notorious communities in Chicago and throughout the country, um, you know, I had my father there who raised us a uh, single parent, but he made sure that we got an education. He made sure that uh, we didn't get involved in games and in violence and stuff like that. I started work when I was 15 at an ice cream pizza parlor. Before that, I actually delivered newspapers. So, I mean, I've always been actively engaged and involved and always knew that I had a lot to live for because I want to make a significant difference in America and so and in the world. And so I know that uh, I can't go out there and commit a violent crime against somebody because I'd wipe away my future, you know. But the other thing I, I, I would say to that is that we just got to be uh, – we already look at race in terms of uh, – you know, policing and prosecution and all of that. When you look at our juvenile temporary detention center, 80% of the kids there at our juvenile temporary detention center in Cook County, 80% of them are African American. Um, now, police make a determination when somebody's committed a crime, whether or not if they're a child, whether or not they, you know, slap them on the wrist and take them back home and say, hey, Johnny did this. You better make sure you discipline Johnny. Next time I'm going to take him down and he's going to get a record. Well, in most instances, in too many of those instances, when it's a black kid involved in it, the police take him to jail mm -hmm. and the prosecutors prosecute. Mm -hmm. can we, can you know, if it's a, if, and, and this is proven. This is not Richard Boykin talking. This is proven. In other instances, when you have white kids involved, they take them home. And they don't take them to the jail. You, you, bring so, up, you bring up two great points there, Mr. Boykin. First, you know, I, something that, that really struck out to me is you said you were raised in a single-parent home but by your father. And, and how important is a fatherly influence in the lives of his children? And that's something we're losing across America, not just only in the black community, but in every community, is how involved fathers are in their children. Um, and, I, you know, you survived one of the toughest neighborhoods in the world because of your father's influence. That's correct. And, and, That's correct. But, and, and the but other I had point, my dad and I had God going for me, so I, I had a good combination. <laughs> and the other point you brought up was how the police make an instant judgment call as soon as they're called to the scene of a crime. And when I was a young lad, I'm white, 
I had uh, me and my buddies were uh, shooting paintball guns in the neighborhood, and somebody called uh, the cops on us, and they 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 uh, the cops came out and took our paintball guns away and said, "I'm going to call your parents," and that was the worst that happened. And I fully agree with you. If I had been if I had been black, I would have probably been taken down to the slammer, and uh, the prosecution would have came after me harder. So I, I I agree with you there. Yeah. So I mean, we have to figure out how do we. Again, cultural sensitivity and fairness. How do we make sure that, uh, you know, we're not just targeting certain people? Now, in Chicago, uh, the mayor closed over 50 schools. Okay. Whenever you close a school, you open up a prison. That's the bottom line. When you close schools, you open up a prison. Uh-huh. If you deny people an opportunity at an equal education or a fair education, if they drop out of school, guess where they're dropping into? Yeah, they're going to drop into the detention center, and then ultimately they become a candidate for Cook County Jail and ultimately the penitentiary. And so that's where we got to stop this. We got to stop this pipeline to prison, and we got to we just got to do it. I mean, because somebody's making a lot of money off these kids who are in prison. Yeah. Somebody making a lot of money. You know, and 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 you know, ultimately. Society pays the price because here you have guys in prison who aren't productive. No, at the end of the day, society pays the price. Absolutely. Right. And when they come out, I mean, what do you do? How about we? How about we just have a standard that every law that we create, it's determined whether or not it's going to increase or decrease our liberty. And if it decreases our liberty, it shouldn't pass. (laughs) Can we use that as our as our as our as our as our tool of judgment? Well, I will say this. Look, if you commit a crime, I think that uh, folks ought to... Yeah, yeah, but let's know, define crime. They ought to be prosecuted. But let's define yeah. crime. I mean, seriously. I mean, the prosecution... Uh, and, 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 and I'm not... Listen, I'm not picking on the black community. That's not. I'm. I'm not doing that at all. The prosecution of the black community and the American and the American people that are imprisoned right now, it's unbelievable. It's outrageous. I mean, we're the land of the free. Yeah, right. As long as you're not in prison, but you know. <laughs> But you know the, the the saying is is that every American commits three felonies a day, and we just don't even know it. I mean that's that's that's, that's lunacy. So Justin's out goofing around as a kid and being an idiot kid, and the fact of whether or not he's a colored individual or a white guy is the determining factor of whether to send him to jail or not. I mean, come on, man, I, 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 that's nuts. Can we just start by I don't know, not making everything a crime? Well, there are 2.2 million Americans incarcerated today in this country, and that's more than any other country in the world. And we have less people than a lot of other countries. So how is it that our people are so much worse that we need to put them in prisons? And you brought up a great point. You said there is a pipeline to prison that creates a lot of money for certain individuals. And we have seen an explosion of private prisons across this country in the last 20 to 30 years that are making a buttload of money off of people who are incarcerated in our prisons today. And it's Not sickening creation. to me. Oh. Oh, no, no, no. It's, wait, time out. How, do you, how on earth does a civilized government decide that it's going to outsource its prisons to private companies? That's a, a... Sorry, I just completely disagree with that. I mean, if one of the obligations of the state is to educate its people, one of the obligations of the state is to deal with people who break their laws. I mean, that's a bunch of hooey, man. But we're outsourcing <laughs> education, too. Well, there you go. Look, I'm in, I'm in agreement with you on that. I'm in total agreement. I think we got to figure out a way to do it better. And hopefully, as a Cook County commissioner, look at the Cook County Jail. We have jail overcrowding. Oh, absolutely. I mean, but, but but you know, we're told that a third of the folks, according to Sheriff Dart, at the Cook County Jail suffer from serious mental illness. Now, oh, in Illinois, and I don't know if it's probably the same all over. Since 2009, we've cut over 160 million from the mental health budget. Yeah, it's the and same all over. And we closed two psychiatric state-run facilities. Uh, the mayor closed six of the 12 mental health clinics in Chicago. Uh, a third of the folks at Cook County Jail suffering from serious mental illness. But the greatness of a nation is determined by how well we treat our children, how well we defenses. treat our uh, senior citizens, and how well we treat the most vulnerable people in our society. Amen. we got to do better. You know, uh, something that you had touched on earlier was uh, the the nature of intact families. If we look at out of wedlock birth rates, first off, since the launch of the Great Society, they've exploded. Uh, out of wedlock birth rates were below six percent in 1965 when we launched the War on Poverty. Nationwide, they're well over 40 percent. 
And if we look at the black community uh, in 2013, it was 72.2, the highest, followed by the Native Americans at, at 66, uh, and then uh, uh, it just can, it, uh, Hispanic Latinos 53%, uh, whites 29.4, and Asians down in single digits. And if we compare crime statistics and poverty to those same categories, we get the exact same figures. Walter Williams wrote an incredible article where he talked about the correlation between out of wedlock birth rates and poverty. And it, you are infinitely more likely to be poor in America if you were born as a white person out of wedlock than to a, as, as a black person born to an intact two parent household. So clearly there is a direct correlation, as, as you talked about earlier, between intact families, a husband and a, and a wife waiting to have children until they get married, preferably after college, after they're established in their career, before they start having children, and the causation of everything else, the crime rate, dropout rate, everything is directly correlated back to that. What can you do as a major political figure in the Chicago area to start turning that tide of out-of-wedlock birth rates in your community? Look, and I agree with all that, and I think, look, what we got to do is all of this stuff begins at home. It begins at home at a very early age. And, you know, it begins with a child can't be what a child can't see. I mean, if a child doesn't see somebody going to work every day, putting on a suit, or just even putting on a hard hat and putting on some construction clothes and going to work, yeah. then that child is not going to understand the value of work. Mm -mm. You know, if a child can't see a loving two-parent uh, family, most likely that child's not going to be in that. So we got to we got to begin to train our children early. But how do you and do we that? got we're, to expose our children to, to God. I mean, I you know, look, I make no secret about it. I'm a licensed minister. But I got involved in the church early. There's nothing more powerful in the black community than the black church. I mean, it's the most central, it's the most powerful institution in black life. And so we got to figure out a way to get folks talking from the pulpit about the importance of family values. Mr. Boykin, and I not served, sacrificing those values. I served on a local school board for 12 years, and the one thing that blew me away is, is, is there's, there's a certain... Uh, uh, resistance to the education system from the black community. We had uh, black mothers telling their children not to get good grades, not to act white, and it, it's something that it confounded fellow board members who were who were off also African American. It was a battle that they were they were trying to to make uh, in in for education. How do you affect that when it's generational? When you know the children don't see it, but the children's parents haven't seen it, and the children's parents' parents haven't seen it. Where do we where do we insert education and family when it's already dissolved? Well, we have to begin to start somewhere. You know, if you want to begin a, a journey of a thousand miles, you have to begin to start walking somewhere. You have to point yourself in that direction. So, I mean, look, if things but that, look but that start of that journey has to come from your community, right? I understand that. No, I no, understand. no, 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 no. But, but it yeah. can, but it but it can also come from the white community. Let me tell you. How can we help? Uh, the civil the civil rights movement, you know, would not have been successful as successful as it was without Cheney, Goodman, and Swerner, yep. without yeah. white folks, Jewish folks who stepped up and who helped, who helped to lead the NAACP, who helped to be involved, without uh, folks who were concerned about making sure that uh, everybody you know, had an opportunity in America to live the American dream. So, I mean, it's, it's a collective responsibility. The responsibility may begin with us first, but that does not absolve. No, absolutely America. not. Absolutely not. So and, we're, and we're, I think, I think the community, oh, I think all of our communities ought to be up to the challenge. So, so yep. again, at this point in time, out of wedlock birth rates in the black community are about three quarters. What action can you take? to start turning the tide on that and drive it back down to 5 or 6%? Look, I think we have to start with education. We have to start with education in our homes. We have to start with education in our churches. We have to start with education in our schools. I mean, we have to begin to talk about these issues and not glorify these issues 
like some of some people have glorified, you know, uh, being single and sleeping around and having many different babies and stuff like that. I mean, it's cool if you're a guy, you know, you you got four or five kids around and you're not taking care of them. No, that's not cool. I mean, I know that in some states, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the government has cracked down and made sure that folks pay child support. But some of these guys don't have jobs. But, you know, they got four and five kids walking around, and they don't see them. They don't spend time with them. So we got to figure out how do we make sure that folks are responsible for life that they actually create or help create. We've been speaking with Richard Richard Boykin, who is the uh, newly elected Cook County Commissioner. He's also a partner in the Chicago and Washington, D.C. offices of Barnes and Thornburg. You can find him on Twitter at Richard R. Boykin. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. It's been a pleasure to talk to you today. Hey, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Look forward to chatting with you again. Absolutely. And uh, congratulations once again as you're getting uh, uh, sworn in on Monday. Hey, thanks. Appreciate you. God bless. Justice and the American way. We are, we are the voices of dissent.